glad that you guys can make it. I'm gonna be brief. I spoke a little bit about this on Wednesday night. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Every time that we have to face a situation that we feel is difficult, we get afraid. And I used to be that way. Sometimes I, I still get a little afraid of having a uh, tough conversation with someone. Uh, some, I don't know if it's, if it's psychology experts, but they call it crucial conversations, conversations that the stakes are high and there's a lot to lose and whatnot. So I used to uh, avoid putting myself in those situations, uh, you know, because I, I, was, I was afraid, am I going to say the right thing, am I going to lose my temper, am I going to say something that I'm going to regret later, but now I don't have to worry about that because I have the assurance and confidence and the boldness that the word of God gives me mm -hmm. because he takes care of everything. Amen. So in Matthew chapter 14, I'm going to read verses 22 to 32. It says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismayed, dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when his disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately... Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. He's calling us out to go from the shore into the waves. He's asking us, when you focus on me, when you trust in me, you can walk in the middle of the worst storm that you can face. And there's nothing that can happen because you're going to walk on water like I did. So... 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God has, has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, yeah. and of a sound mind. Amen. We're no longer afraid, right. because we have him. So I encourage you to also not be afraid, because he gives us the assurance that through him, everything's possible. Amen. 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 That's it. I have some uh, good news to share. It is official. My mother is coming. Yeah. Plane ticket was bought yesterday, so there's no turning back. Uh, so she'll be here with uh, one of my sisters. They'll be here for about a month. So it's going to be good. Anyone has any prayer requests, testimonies they would like to share? Yes. I've got a coworker that they came in last Sunday. I'm not sure if it was a fish fryer or one of those turkey fryers. Grease went off and he's moving from Des Moines to Iowa City. It's like second, third degree burns over 60 or 80 percent of his body.
also would like a prayer for my wife's brother. Yesterday, he went on this anti-God rant on Facebook. And uh, I don't know why, because all three of them were raised in uh, church. But I think that they feel lost. So I uh, declare the revelation of the Holy Spirit will come to them. And whatever blindfold they have right now, it's yeah. it's gone, yeah. and they come to see the truth. Amen. 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 Anyone else? Yes, you said. I just want to thank God for the warfare, just the warfare that occurred in this place and in this house and in this land mm -hmm. uh, Friday night. We took a victory lap around the church. We anointed the parking lot with oil. We prayed for this whole church, this whole building, for those that are here that are facing battles that are unnecessary in my opinion. The enemy is defeated mm -hmm. and he needs to remember it. Amen. And um, also praying for those who are yet to come in mm -hmm. and whatever was holding them back is mm -hmm. no longer right. holding them back. And they're yeah. free to come and receive the grace yeah. of God that he yes. is so desperately desiring. Praise yes. the Lord. Yes, yes. 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 Just keep, keep me in prayer. It's it's overwhelming to me. I have full confidence God has my back. And, uh, I'm going to go to the shelter tomorrow. They just put me up in a hotel. I, I can't keep doing that. People have been very kind to me. But I can't be living in a hotel. I, I'm waiting for a place. I, I have an income tax check coming for $800 in May. I'm going to get Social Security. I'm just thinking about getting an apartment. <coughs> Wait with these people, but uh, it's just overwhelming. I got fines to pay. I got how to get around. How not enough time in the day. But uh, I was telling Suzanne today, if you go work for four hours, it's an eight-hour day riding the bus. Yes. Uh, it'll be all right. God, God put that out to me. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 I'm just anxious to get on with my life and get a place. And Yes.
and she was bedridden and had to be carried from place to place. So thank the Lord for continuing to heal her and continue prayer for her, continue praying for my Aunt Mary. She's in and out of the hospital and a lot of things going on. She's not going to take radiation or chemo, but they say that, you know, these other treatments aren't going to work unless she does that, but God's still able. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, uh, Mary, that God healed her diverticulitis here, I took her to the doctor this week and had an MRI. We prayed before she went. All the tests came back negative Mom. for that, so thank the Lord for that. Oh, she has a lot of back pain, so I just prayed that the Lord take her back pain away, and she yes. calls and says, it's better every time you pray. It's better, so mm -hmm. I'm just Lord. continuing to believe with her you know, that the Lord's going to help that situation. Oh, we never know the impact we're making even through this. Right. I was over at the Mel Church last week, and somebody came up to me and um, said they watch our broadcast, they want to come over to our church and visit, so <clears throat> said that they were just really, really hungry, and they feel like from what they've seen here that we really get deeper in the Word, so Glory. we are making an impact. Glory. Thank the Lord for that, so just Amen. pray for that situation, and you, when time's right, you know, I'm not trying to take them away from anywhere else. No, 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 no. I didn't say anything to them. They, no, they no. told me. Right. Actually, they said, well, I was coming to your church today, <laughs> but no. So I'm sure it's going to happen at some point. Amen. <laughs> Father, we thank you for gathering us here to your presence today, Lord. We thank you, Father, that you can take away our fear and you give us the courage and the boldness to go face any situation in your mighty name, Lord. We are armed with your word, which is stronger than any sword. Father, we go into your situations and we declare and speak your word, a word that goes forth and changes things puts them back into their appropriate position, Lord. We declare that the healing is taking place in those that are in need of healing. Father, right now, we declare that whatever is suppressing them is coming from this world and not from you. And in your mighty name, Lord, it is gone right now in Jesus' name. Father, we declare that you will restore all broken relationships. You will bring families together, relatives together, Lord. You will provide for us, Father. You will open doors that no man can close to So thank you, Father, for giving us opportunities so we can continue to share your word and bring you glory. It's funny because people don't understand what change is until they actually experience it. So sometimes when you talk about what the Lord has done in your life, it feels like it's falling on deaf ears. But then he touches the person in, right in that moment. Now I get what you're talking about. Yeah. It's funny. It's no big deal. No, no announcement? All right, well, let's speak the word. Will you not revive us again?
that your people may rejoice in you. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord reviews the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Uh, Toby and John, would you mind taking the offering? Toby, can you say the blessing, please? Now is your time, God. We call out to you if you will raise up your spirit. It's time to spirit it up, Lord God. Raise it in your people, Lord, that it overflows and hits every situation. Your spirit conquers all things that come against it, for your word is faithful and we stand on it. Now, Lord, we ask that you anoint your word today being spoken here. Yes, Lord. We all will take it in, Lord God Jesus, and it will be better for us, God. Hallelujah. Now bless this offering. Bless the gift and the gifter in the mighty name. Hallelujah. 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 Pretty teaching uh, out of Jeremiah 1 early this morning. And the bottom line, what they were trying to get across was the problem is not our behavior. The problem is our identity. Who we are in Christ. Who we are in the Lord. I thought that was I thought that was awesome. Because the Lord is just so much revealing that here. And here, clear across the country, the Spirit is speaking the same thing. Hallelujah. 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 Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess, Jesus Christ, He is Lord forever. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ, He is Lord forever.
Your grace that rescues me. Your mercy goes much deeper, farther than I can see. Stand in your presence, Lord. Glorify and magnify your name. Glorify and holy name. Worthy, 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 Lord. And lift your name. Where could I go?
earth as it is in heaven. Binding in the shaking. Binding in the shaking. Yes, Lord. Your kingdom come in this place right now, Lord.
Jesus. Praise God. Let's just continue to praise the Lord right now. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we praise you this morning. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. We love you, Lord. We bless your name. Hallelujah. You are a great and a mighty God, Lord. There's none like you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your favor, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your great love by which you have loved us. Hallelujah, Jesus. We bless your name this morning. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Everybody say praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You all may be seated. Praise God. Thank you, worship team, as always. Great job. Amen. Being sensitive to the Lord. Hallelujah. And thank all of you for your, uh, for those of you that are aware of it, I, we didn't, we didn't really make much of an announcement or anything, but uh, uh, I appreciate all of your prayers and uh, Remembering us over the past week or so, my mother passed away. She lived a good long life. She was 92 and uh, full of Jesus. Yes. Amen. And uh, with him right now, praise the Lord. So thank you enough for your prayers and for Suzanne standing in for me two weeks in a row. I appreciate that. She did a great job. Yes. I did get a uh, watch last week's service. I didn't get to chance to see the one before, but uh, she did a great job, and the worship team, as always, Mike just does a fantastic job with them, and so appreciate everybody's faithfulness, and God is good, amen? amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Just remember, you're unique, yes. just like everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Ba-boom, I'm back, hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> It was weird, you know, my mother, <clears throat> the last year or so, uh, had really declined, and her memory was just shot. I mean, she, she wouldn't remember which one of us boys were there, and she'd call me my brother's name, my brother's me, and I'd always say, my brother always said that uh, I was her favorite, which the fact was, I was the one that was always in trouble, so I got the most attention, but... Uh, she got a little ornery with me one day. She was just having a bad day. And when I left, my brother and his wife were coming in. And I said, Dave, she thinks I'm you today. <laughs> uh, so praise the Lord. But it reminds me of memories. You know, this guy went to see a, an old Indian who was supposedly had this just impeccable memory. I mean, he could remember anything. So the guy walks up and says, how? And he says, uh, tell me what you had for breakfast February 13th, 1961. And the Indian said, eggs. The guy just shook his head and walked away. Ten years later, he's back in the same village, and he stops in again to see this, this old Indian. Walks up to him, and he says, how? The Indian says, fried. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. So... Praise the Lord. Amen. God's good, isn't he? Amen. Thank the Lord. Well, I want us to turn uh, to Mark chapter 2, and we'll start at verse 15. We'll read verses 15 through 17. You know, the uh, Jews have a saying that everything in life, every, everything in the world, whether it's a leaf, uh, a flower, a bird, uh, they all contain the secret word of life. Yes. It's what separates us from the stones and the clay, 
right? Paul called it the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That secret word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the scripture says we beheld his glory, that of the only begotten. So now the word, that secret word dwells in each one of us. It's the secret of real life, the secret of eternal life. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. He will never leave us or forsake us. That's right. Thank you, Praise Lord. the Lord. And the, the scripture even says that the day will come when he'll give us a name that only we know. The secret word for each one of us in mm -hmm. this great mystery of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Yes. Praise the Lord. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. I don't have any righteousness of my own or any way of developing it, but I am the righteousness of God in him. That's how God sees me. That's how God sees you. And all of our labors and all of our trying and striving uh, is a great waste of energy because he's already done it all. He expended himself totally, so that we don't have to, praise the Lord, so that we can rest in his grace and his goodness, praise the Lord. Okay, Mark chapter 2, verse 15, and it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, how is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Praise the Lord. Jesus says he's not coming for the righteous. And when he says that, he doesn't mean that some people don't need him. The, the, the clue to what Jesus means is his reference here to him being a physician. Because you go to a doctor for a reason. Right. You go to a doctor when you have health problems. Or you can't deal with those problems yourself. You can't uh, just self-manage your health situation or issue. So you go to a doctor. Right. Now what do you want from a doctor? Well, you don't want just advice. Praise the Lord. But you want intervention. Right. Praise the Lord. You don't just want the doctor to say, yeah, you're sick. <laughs> no, you want some medicine. Right. You know, you, you want some treatment. Right. Praise the Lord. So Jesus calls people righteous who are in the same position spiritually as those who go to a doctor. Excuse me, as those who won't go to a doctor. Right. That's who, what he's referring to here. when he's, he's not talking about us being the righteousness of God in Christ. He's talking about here in the context of of these scribes and Pharisees, he's saying they're righteous in that they won't go to a doctor. That's what he's, he's claiming. They don't, they, they don't think they need to go to a doctor. They don't think they have uh, need of a physician. So the righteous people in this context are the people who believe they can heal themselves, right. who can fix their own issues and their own problems. So Jesus is saying to these people, and when he, he, he's saying... I'm, I'm calling sinners, right? Jesus is saying, come, <coughs> excuse me, to these sinners. He's saying, come, those who know that they are morally, those who know that they are spiritually unable to save themselves. These are the ones that he's talking to. These are the ones that need to come to him. The righteous are the people who think they have no need of a physician in this context. Praise the Lord. All right, now let's look at Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28. It came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have you never read that David, what David did when he had need and was in a hunger, and he and they that were with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and did eat the shewbread, 
which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest. And gave also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So Jesus claimed to be able to forgive sins in another place. Remember where he said, uh, is it more difficult to say your sins are forgiven than to heal this individual? Because the Pharisees were all freaking out that he was somehow making himself equal with God. And they called it blasphemy, praise the Lord. But Jesus goes on to make a claim that's so outrageous in this place that he is the Sabbath, Lord of the Sabbath, amen? And the leaders don't even have a word for it. It's beyond blasphemy. They're just totally freaked. Now, when, when Jesus declares not that he has come to reform religion, but that he's here to end religion and to replace it with himself, that's what's happening right here in this particular portion of Scripture. It's actually happening all throughout the gospel, but that's what he is actually saying here to these scribes and Pharisees. Their, their, their religion is all about rules and regulations. The Sabbath is one of the greatest examples of that. And that's why Jesus addresses it here. He says the Sabbath wasn't, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. And then he says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. So he's, he's not saying, I'm, I've come here to reform or to kind of tweak religion. He's saying, I've come to just do away with it. Right. Praise the Lord, all three of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just telling you what the Lord said. The law of God in, in the, this Hebraic uh, context, which is where all you know, religion is similar, but in the law of God, you were directed that you have rest from your work one day out of seven. That was the law. And that was great. I mean, it was good. You got a day off. You, you, you got a day of rest, right? But the religious leaders had turned that rest into work by adding specific rules and regulations concerning the Sabbath. There are 39 different types of activity that you could not do on the Sabbath. And one of them happened to be reaping grain, which is what the disciples were doing in this particular scripture. Let's look at Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. And he saith unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. So why does Jesus get angry, amen, at these religious leaders? Well, because the Sabbath is about restoring the diminished. That's why God gave us the Sabbath originally under the Old Covenant, so that you could re-strengthen yourself, so that you could be what had been diminished throughout the week by your work and effort could be restored. Yes. Amen. Amen. It's about replenishing the drain. It's about repairing the broken. That's right. the purpose for the Sabbath. And so to heal this man's shriveled hand is to do exactly what the Sabbath is all about. But religion didn't get it. Because they were so focused, these guys are so concerned that the Sabbath regulations be observed that they don't want Jesus to heal this guy. Right. Praise the Lord. Is it sounding more like religion to anybody? Hallelujah. Amen. It's a perfect example of not seeing the forest for the trees. Their hearts are as shriveled up as this guy's hand was. 
They're insecure. And they're anxious about these regulations. And they're judgmental, self-obsessed people instead of caring about the man. They're totally introverted, totally thinking about what we got to do, how we're going to do it, instead of having any concern about this individual. Why? One word. Religion. Jesus is showing us that there are two radically different spiritual paradigms. A paradigm is just simply a pattern or an example, a model for how you're going to achieve something or do something. So there's two, he's showing us two completely different paradigms. So imagine two people both trying to obey the law of God, yet they operate from these two opposing paradigms. Both want to keep the Sabbath day. Both of them want to do what it is they're supposed to do. But in one case, the obedience is a burden. It's enslavement. While in the other, it's rest. It's joy. It's what it was supposed to be. Amen? Now, how can it be? How can you have those two opposing Paradigms, if you will, trying to accomplish the same thing. One paradigm is religion. I said a while back, religion is basically advice on how to do and what to do and when to do it and so on and so forth. The gospel is just good news. Beginning and end, it's just news. It's just good news. It's not advice. Praise the Lord. So one is this paradigm of religion, and the other is the gospel of Jesus Christ. One is about advice. The other is about news, about good news. These are two completely different things. Most people in the world believe that if there's a God, you relate to God by being good. Praise the Lord. Lord Jody, praise the Lord. I'm just saying, most people believe if there's a God, the way you relate to him is you be good. Praise the Lord. Most religions are based on that principle. They're based on a code of conduct. See, it's, it's this these rules and these regulations, this code of conduct, these principles that you then use to follow in order for God to show you favor. If you perform it, if you you obey, then you're accepted. And you expect, you know, a pat on the head every once in a while. A good thing will come your way. Favor. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is not only different from that, It is diametrically opposed to that. It is completely the opposite of that. Now, I want you to think about this because this is the the thing about religion. Everybody thinks, well, religion, there's nothing wrong with religion. Religion is a nightmare. (laughs) I'm not talking about faith. I'm not talking about a relationship with Jesus. I'm not talking about a denomination. I'm just talking about religion, period is insane. It is. It is. The advice that you get yeah. won't help you. Right. You need some good news. Yes. Everybody needs the good news. Yes. Praise the Lord. In religion, the purpose of obeying the law is to assure that you're all right with God. Yes. Well, that's great if you could obey the law. But since we can't, you might say, I I, I don't do this and I don't do that. But if you fail in one place, one point in the law, you fail in all of it, the Bible says. So by definition, you've got to be crazy to be involved in religion or just blinded to the truth. I'm not saying it's wrong to go to church. I'm saying you need to have a relationship with Jesus that isn't based on the law. 
but based on the good news that Jesus Christ has paid the price for your inability to do it. So the result is when you come to the law, what you're most concerned about is just like the Pharisees. Details. What do I got to do? How do I do it? How often do I have to do it? How long do I have to do it? How much should I do? How little can I not do and still be all right with God? I mean, it's details, details, details. Can I dress like this? Do I have to dress like that? Can I wear this? Can I wear that? Can I cut my hair? Do I grow a beard? Can I have a TV? Can I not have a TV? Can I go to the movies? Can I have a beard? Can I do this? Can I do... You know what I'm saying? And... For the most part, it's no, 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 no. Praise God. You want to know exactly what you've got to do because you've got to push all the right buttons. Or you're in big trouble. Now, you're not going to bother finding out the intent of that law. Instead, you tend to write into the law all sorts of details about how to observe the law. Can anybody say amen? Have you ever, anybody ever been in church where you got lots of rules? And when you think about those rules, you're not really looking at the intent. At least I, I really don't think I ever did. Not really trying to look behind it or deeply into it to find out the intent of that law because I was so busy trying to figure out how am I going to keep that law? And what is, you know, if, if, if maybe this isn't enough, so we got to do a little bit more. Right. Yeah. This, is, this is denominations. Uh-huh. It's, it's just different interpretations of how to keep laws. Right. How to perform your religion in order to get God's favor. Right. I'm not picking on denominations. I'm, I'm picking on religion. I'm just saying... The reason we have 50,000 different denominations is because everybody's trying to tell you there's a different way in order to please God. And Jesus never came to give us religion or denominations. He came to give us good news. He came to set us free from the curse of the law. This forever trying to figure out what more do I have to do and if that's good then a little bit more ought to be even better. That's the trap that these Jews got into. God just gave them a day of rest and it wasn't long before they had 39 different things you cannot do and you you know you can only walk so many paces. You can't light a candle, you can't cook food. You can't I mean what kind of a rest is that? You got to sit still in the dark hungry. That's not my idea of a day off. Now I'm not making fun of Israel. I'm just saying That is exactly what happened. And that's what Jesus is addressing here. Religion. The reason you do this in religion, start digging up more ways to observe the particular rules and regulations, is so that you can be sure that you're obeying. Amen? Amen? It's religious preoccupation. Mm-hmm. It's being totally mm-hmm. immersed in rules and regulations, and they're not even enough. Now you got to you got to figure out. Okay, now you know I need to do a little bit more of this because you know I want God's favor. I, I need God's help. But look what Jesus says here in Mark two twenty seven and twenty eight. He's addressing, remember again, he's addressing religion. And he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So Jesus affirms, in fact, he even celebrates the original principle of the Sabbath. He's not saying we shouldn't have a Sabbath. He's He's celebrating, he's affirming the original purpose, principle of the Sabbath. And at the same time, he's saying, because of this Sabbath, you have rest. 
That is the purpose of the Sabbath. The purpose of the Sabbath is for you to rest, to not work, to not labor, not to have a bunch of rules put on you about how to do that, but just rest. Just stop the work for a day. Amen? And at the same time, he exposes the legalism that is around the observance of this so-called rest, this Sabbath. He dismantles the whole religious paradigm, and he does it by pointing to his own identity. The word Sabbath means to uh, have a deep rest, deep peace. It's a synonym for shalom. And we know that's what it means. So it's a state of wholeness, of flourishing in every area of life. Yes. So when Jesus says, I am Lord of the Sabbath, what he means and what he's actually saying there is, I am the Sabbath. Uh -huh. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. He's the source of the deep rest that every one of us needs, yes. that everybody needs. Amen. He came to completely change the way we rest. Yes. The one day a week rest was nothing more than everything else in the Old Testament, a type and a shadow. It was a shadow of the deep divine rest that we have in Christ. Yes. Praise the Lord. Another level, a, a deeper level of rest. You know, at the end of Genesis chapter 1, God says he rested from his work. Yes. And what's that mean? Does God get tired? No. So how could he rest? Well, there's different kinds of rest. How about to be so satisfied with your work so completely satisfied that you can just leave it alone. Mm -hmm. And that's what God was saying. It is finished. I'm, it's good. He looked at it. He said, it's good. I'm finished. And now I'll rest. He didn't have to lie down on the couch. Didn't need a nap. He just meant, I'm satisfied. I'm done. I'm resting from that work. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to tweak it. I'm not going to try to, you know, perfect it. It's perfect. It's exactly the way I want it. Now I'm going to rest. So when God finished creating, he said, it's good. And he rested. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. See, there's a work underneath God's work that we really need a rest from. It's the work of self-justification. It's the work that causes us to take refuge in religion. To not trust God with the relationship. Most people work and work and they're trying to prove to themselves or to convince God and other people that they're good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. And that work is never over mm. unless we rest in the good news. Mm -hmm. yes. The gospel. the end of God's act of creation, he said, it's finished, and he could rest. On the cross, at the end of his act of redemption, Jesus said, it's finished, and we can rest. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. It's perfect what I did. There's nothing more that needs to be done. I don't need to go back and try to fix it or add to it or take away from it. It's exactly what I wanted to do, so now you can rest. Praise the Lord. On the cross, Jesus was talking about 
the work that's underneath his work. The thing that makes you truly weary. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. The thing that makes you really tired is this need to prove yourself. Over and over and over and over. Because you're never good enough. Here's the news. That is finished. Praise the Lord. It's called the great exchange. His life for ours. God is satisfied. You can be satisfied. If he's satisfied, why shouldn't we be satisfied? Why do we feel like there's something else we are supposed to do in order to satisfy God. He's satisfied. It's finished. Rest. Not one day a week. Every day, 24 hours a day for the rest of your life. Only to rest in eternity. In what he's done. To do otherwise is to undermine the very gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's also a complete... uh, In the face argument with it's God that works in you both to will and do of his good pleasure, not you. You say, wait a minute, you're giving us a free ride. I'm not. He did. And I challenge you. I don't care what the religion is. I don't care if it's Islam. I don't care if it's uh, Hinduism, uh, Hare Krishna, Christianity as we normally would define it. They're all doing the same thing. It's what, it's what you got to do. Uh-huh. That is finished. That's what Jesus came here for. To miss that is to miss the entire purpose. Uh-huh. To miss that diminishes what God has done. Uh-huh. Jesus said, I am Lord of the Sabbath. And he says it everywhere. He says it all the time. I am the bread of life. I am light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. I am the good shepherd. That's the name that God uses for himself. Not all these that we we speak, but the one he identifies himself. I am. Because the Lord of the Sabbath said it is finished. We can rest from religion forever. This is not religion. This is fellowship. This is worship and praise. This is understanding the the gospel, the good news, and how it benefits us, what what we can have as a result of it. It's church. But the church is just the ecclesia. It's just the people that have been called out of darkness into the light. It's not a bunch of rules. If it were about the rules, they had that already. They had it in spades. And Jesus told him, he said, unless your righteousness, your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you're not entering the kingdom. Therefore, nobody was righteous enough because we know they were they were rule-keeping righteous people. But they're all, for all of their rule-keeping, it did not give them the righteousness standard that God required. Right, right. That's why he came. I'll tell you an imaginary conversation. I don't, I don't know who the author of this was, but uh, so I'm not, I'm stealing it, but you know, I'm not. <laughs> I'd like to say who I stole it from, but I don't even know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But there's an uh, imaginary conversation between early Christian, uh, an early Christian and, and their neighbor. And the neighbor says, I hear you're religious. Great. Religion's a good thing. Where's your temple? Oh, uh, we don't have a temple. 
praise the Lord. Jesus is our temple. But, but where do your priests perform their sacrifices uh, in order for you to have favor with God? Uh, we don't have any sacrifices. Jesus is our high priest and our sacrifice. Yes. And the pagan says, well, what kind of religion is that? And the answer is, it's no kind of religion at all. Exactly. It was never meant to be. Exactly. It's to be about a relationship restored yes. right. with God exactly. that only God could restore. Exactly. And it's a free gift to us. That's the good news. Amen. There's no advice that comes with it other than receiving it. Right. And the yes. advice ends there and the gift takes over. Right. Praise, the Lord. Praise the Lord. You'll do more righteous acts yes. by accident exactly. because of the grace of God yes. than you'll ever do by self-discipline uh -huh. or fear of judgment or condemnation from yes. an organization or other people or even your misconceptions of God. Right. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's the good news. Amen. That's the gospel. It's not about religion. It's about him Amen. and what he's done for us. Yes. Can you say praise the Lord? Yes. Praise Give the Lord. him a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and this is the rest. Scripture says, where the weary shall find rest. All prophesied. Isn't it strange that we don't see that so many times? When we have all these prophetic words about it's, it's the rest, it's the, it's the fulfillment, it's the completion. And then we spend the rest of our lives laboring for something that's already been freely given to us. Let me just close with this. When Jesus, the scripture says he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness and tempted. That's, that's a misinterpretation. He was not tempted. He certainly wasn't tempted of God. God doesn't tempt anybody. He's, he, he's not tempted and he tempts no man. Jesus wasn't tempted. He was tested. And he wasn't tested by God because he was God. God knows he's perfect. He didn't need to test him. He was tested by the enemy to see if he really knew his identity, if he really understood what his identity was. If you think about your life, it isn't temptation that we have to worry about. It's the tests. And the tests do not come from God. God isn't testing to see. He's already declared us to be perfect. Yes. Yes. Amen? He's already said we are the righteousness of God in Christ. There's no testing going on from God. No. The test comes from the enemy. Right. The tests that we go through, the trials, uh -huh. they're coming as a result of the enemy because he's challenging your identity the same as he did Jesus. Mm -hmm. Do you really know you're a child of God? Do you really understand your position? Do you really understand what authority you have? Yes. Or are you going to let him push you around and shove you from place to place and, and test you over your religion? The tests come as not about religion. The tests come about your relationship to God. Sickness, disease, poverty. Every challenge, every test that comes is to see, are you going to stand or are you going to fold like a cheap suitcase? Are you going to just buckle up and forget about it? Or are you going to, as was said here today, praise the Lord in every test, in every situation. This life is a test. It's a test. And it's a test that the enemy is giving us over and over and over. And the sad truth is religion has sided up with him. Not intentionally, but nevertheless... They're doing the same thing. They're testing you all the time. Yes. Right. You're not good enough. Are you good enough this right. week? Have you been good enough today? Have you been good enough? Will you be good enough next week? Right. It's a test. God has marked us A+. Plus. Yes. 
You've passed the test. Yes. There's no more test. Exactly. Quit taking it. Yeah. Tear it up. Throw it back in his face. Yes. You take the test. Yes. He's flunked the test. Yes. Right? Yes. And here we are trying to cheat off of his paper. Yes. Think about it. Yeah. That's what we're doing. We're copying off of the enemy's crib. You know, we're getting a crib sheet off of the enemy, and he's flunked. Yes. Yeah. You know, just when you get to that classroom, just keep on going. Yeah. Don't go in. Don't take the paper. Don't sit down. Don't start studying. Don't do the test. We've already passed the test. Uh, Amen? Amen? It's like me in college. I went through college. In the front door, right through and out the back door. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I did attend a few times, but I had this thing about tests. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. We've got the perfect score. Yes. Quit taking the test. Quit yeah. letting the enemy deceive you. And quit letting him grade you. Yeah. Praise yeah. the Lord. Yeah. No more tests. Yeah. Hallelujah. We just, we study this not to pass a test. We study this to find out what our inheritance is. Yeah. What we can expect what we can anticipate from God right. and how to deal with an enemy right. who does nothing but lie. Right. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good yes. in every situation, yes. in every circumstance. He's always good. No matter what it looks like, right. he is the same. Yes. The enemy's job is to get you to focus on the temporary things that are going on instead of the one constant right. that never changes. He wants you to think that the temporary is permanent. Mm -hmm. He wants you to think that it can't be, nothing can be done about it. Right. When God has already done everything that needs to be done right. about everything. Yes. Amen. One more hand clap for the Lord. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Thank the Lord. Praise God. God bless all of you. Yes. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Yes. Class dismissed. Gold stars yeah. for everybody.